Well, thank you, Kent, and uh, good morning, everybody. I'm glad to see so many Nashvilleians taking advantage of this great opportunity to spend a Saturday with acclaimed author Robert Massey. And I want to say thank you to the Nashville Public Library Foundation for arranging Mr. Massey's visit. From time to time, our events uh, outgrow our space at the Nashville Public Library, and we are grateful to uh, good neighbors like the University School for graciously hosting us. Uh, so thank you, Vince, and thank you, uh, University School. We are also fortunate to have a great public library. Our library enriches and supports us and provides opportunities to learn, to connect, and to engage with arts, cultures, and the issues of the today. Our library continues to grow and to grow Nashville as a city of readers. I think one of the things I would want for this city more than anything else is for this city to be a city of lifelong learners, uh, people who value reading and, and value knowledge. Our library is definitely part of what makes Nashville great. And part of what makes Nashville's library great is the strong support of the Nashville Public Library Foundation. Per perhaps most prominently, the foundation annually gives a literary award to recognize great authors and share them with Nashville. Thanks to the foundation, over the past 10 years, Nashville has enjoyed public lectures from literary giants, including John Irving at the Ryman, and poet Billy Collins at Hume Fogg, and welcome Margaret Atwood to the city for our first Nashville Reads. Today, we are excited to welcome Robert Massey. Following his best-selling history of Nicholas and Alexander, Mr. Massey won the Pulitzer Prize for his biography of Peter the Great. Robert Massey then authored uh, substantive engaging histories of World War I and returned to the Romanovs with the final chapter. Most recently, he received the Carnegie Medal for Excellence for his illuminating and entertaining biography of Catherine the Great. We look forward to hearing him discuss Catherine the Great with us this morning. So please join me in giving a very warm Nashville welcome to Robert Massey. Thank you, Carl. I've never been introduced by uh, a mayor before, and uh, I appreciate your coming to do this. And I, uh, as I've said to you, I've heard about your uh, administration, and I hope you won't be mayor long, because I hope you'll go. I don't mean the, the mayor out, mayor being mayor is a stepping stone, but I've heard such good things. I hope you're going up the ladder. We need, in our, in our country, uh, we need politicians like you in both parties. And I'm grateful to Bobby and Carol Frist for their uh, contribution to the library, which has made it possible for me to be here. I'm grateful to everybody at the library who, I've been here a day, uh, I'm gonna be here another day or so, and I, I'm having a wonderful time. Uh, I'm also gr grateful to Vince Dernan because uh, he made the university school auditorium available when uh, the library was uh, unreachable. Uh, because of what's going on on uh, the good things that are going on on Church Street today. Uh, as uh, you've already been told, I know this room pretty well. I went to, uh, it was then called Peabody, uh, part of Peabody College, and uh, as when Peabody College went to Vanderbilt, um, it became the university school and Harvey Sperling, the former uh, headmaster or director or whatever he, the title is called, uh, became the uh, uh, head of uh, the high school and then turned it over to Vince Dernan. Uh, I've been back once or twice. 
and always with great pleasure. And it has grown uh, in stature and in size. Uh, it goes out there, goes in all directions, and the graduates are going off to great universities. It's a wonderful institution. Um, my closest friend, Jack May, and I and my brother, uh, we call ourselves brothers, all three of us. Uh, I've been back to see Jack often, and he keeps me uh, up to date about what's going on, and I've never heard anything which wasn't uh, better than good. So I'm very happy to be here. And you've got a, gotten an inkling of what I've been up to in the past, whatever it is, 60 years. I graduated in, uh, from Peabody in the uh, spring of 1946. You can do the arithmetic while I'm talking in your head. <laughs> I like to say when people say, how old are you? I say, uh, well, figure it out. I was born in the presidential administration of Calvin Coolidge. And most of the people I say it to who are younger have never heard of Calvin Coolidge. <laughs> who is he? He comes uh, along with uh, James K. Polk and uh, John Tyler and those uh, um, presidents of the uh, pre-Civil War era. <laughs> Tonight, uh, I'm going to talk uh, for a few minutes about uh, Catherine the Great, and then uh, if you have any questions, I'd be glad to try to, to answer them. Um, biographers and historians tell true stories. Uh, and th they try, we try, I've written both, to make them interesting. As uh, uh, you were said, said a minute ago, I tried to make them, uh, I tried to bring the characters alive. And I've had uh, some success. It's never been easier than with Catherine the Great, who was a remarkable person, a remarkable woman, uh, somebody I learned to admire greatly. I have had uh, a strong mother, who some of you uh, remember, uh, who was a Nashville uh, uh, force, I think for good, Molly Todd. Uh, and I uh, have had been married twice, so I have had two strong wives, and I have four strong daughters. Uh, I'm still learning about women. <laughs> but Catherine uh, helped me learn, and for those of you who have the time and the inclination to read that book, I think you will see what I mean. She was an example, not only in her own day, but for uh, women and men who want to learn about women today. So the, what I'm going to do is just run briefly through a true story, uh, a synopsis of a true story about a little girl who was born a relative nobody and grew up to be, become this remarkable woman and empress of Russia. She lived in the, through much of the 18th century. She was a contemporary of George Washington, uh, John Adams, Thomas Jefferson, uh, of Voltaire, Marie Antoinette, uh, and Maximilien Robespierre, the evil genius of the latter part of the French Revolution. Her life was the ultimate success story. She was born in 1929 in the Germany of Frederick the Great. Uh, she used her intelligence her determination, her courage, her character to defeat constant frustration and frequently despair. She was learning always, all her life, always learning about human nature, politics, philosophy, about men and women, until at the age of 32, halfway through her life, she reached a summit where in the thousand, 
I believe, in the thousand year history of European monarchy, only one other woman had or has stood, Elizabeth I of England. She was born an obscure German princess. Uh, it wasn't much to be a princess in the Germany 18th century. Every little principality and dukedom and, and uh, um, almost town and village had its own royalty. There was no German empire in those days. The strongest power was the Prussia of, of Frederick the Great. When uh, she was born, her 16-year-old mother, Joanna, had desperately wanted a son. Sons were useful, they could inherit. Daughters were a burden. They had to be found husbands, they had to be provided with dowries, and then they went off to live in another little village. Uh, but Joanna was so disappointed to have produced a girl uh, that she never touched or even or cradled or showed affection for her firstborn child. My father thought I was an angel, she, and she was named then Sophia, Sophia of Anhalt Zerbst. She wrote in her memoirs, uh, when she was Catherine the Great, she looked back on her earlier life before she was on the throne, and she wrote, my father thought I was an angel. My mother didn't bother about me much. A year and a half later, my mother gave birth to a son whom she idolized, and I stood by her bed and watched her cradle and nurture my little brother. When I was seven, she continues, all dolls and playthings were taken away from me, and I was told that I was a big girl now, and that such things were no longer suitable for me. I don't know whether I was really ugly as a child, but I remember very well that I was often told that I was, and that for this reason, I ought to strive for intelligence and the inner virtues. As for her schooling, uh, here we are. As for schooling, I was terribly inclined, she said, I was terribly inclined to ask questions and was very headstrong. With my principal teacher, a Lutheran clergyman appointed by my father, I argued stubbornly that it was very unjust that all the great men of antiquity, of the pre-Christian era, who were nevertheless virtuous, should be condemned to hell because they had not been baptized and known salvation. For this, the clergyman insisted that my governess beat me. At 14, Sophia traveled across the snow to Russia because the childless Empress Elizabeth, the daughter of Peter the Great, needed a, young, needed a young woman to marry the heir to the Russian throne, her nephew, her 15-year-old nephew, Peter, and between them produce a baby who would ensure the continuation of the Romanov dynasty. Catherine was uh, not celibate, but never married and produced a child. Sophie had remembered meeting the Empress Elizabeth. She was tall, very tall. Her dress was trimmed uh, with, with silver taffeta, trimmed with gold lace. She wore on her head a black feather which stood upright on one side, and many diamonds glittered in a headdress made of her own hair. Peter, unfortunately, the designated husband to be, was physically and psychologically deficient. He was very small and childlike, wrote the designated wife. He loved to talk to me about his playthings and toy soldiers. At 16, Sophia converted to orthodoxy from Lutheranism 
became a Russian Grand Duchess and was renamed Catherine. Sophia disappeared. Waiting to be married, she and her maids of honor sat on her bedroom floor one night and quote, had, quote, a great argument about the difference between the sexes. I believe that most of us were entirely innocent. I swear that it, in spite of my 16 years, I still had no idea what the difference between boys and girls could possibly be. That year before the marriage could take place, Peter developed smallpox, one of the scourges of the 18th century. When Catherine saw him after the fever had broken, she said, I was shocked, my blood froze, his face was completely disfigured and extremely swollen. I couldn't recognize him. They married nevertheless. And for the next nine years, they slept together in the same bed, and Peter never touched her. Instead, her husband's nocturnal activity usually consisted of piling the bed high with toy soldiers and playing with them for two or three hours until he fell asleep, and she was allowed to sleep. During the day, he played his violin uh, and trained his hunting dogs uh, in the winter in the bedroom. Catherine wrote, from seven in the morning until late at night, I was obliged to listen to him scraping his violin. Uh, as a writer, I approve and admire her choice of that verb <laughs> because right here on this stage, I used to scrape a violin. <laughs> I never advanced but beyond the last row of the second violins. Uh, but uh, scraping is probably what my parents, in honesty, would have described the sounds they heard at our house. And she said, uh, I was uh, obliged to listen to the barking and horrible howling of five or six hunting dogs, which he was cudgeling horribly for misbehavior. I suffered terribly from tortured eardrums, excepting perhaps the dogs, no one was as unhappy as I was. After nine years of nothing, uh, Elizabeth, the empress, desperate for a baby, took a drastic step by offering Catherine a choice. She said, why don't you, there are other ways. Why don't you uh, make a choice between either Monsieur Narishkin or Monsieur Saltikov, courtiers whom you know and apparently like, and some, one of them could become the father, and we will proclaim him uh, your husband's son and make him the heir in waiting to the throne. Uh, Catherine agreed, and in fact she was seduced by uh, Sergei Saltikov, and the story, her description of their, uh, the beginning of their relationship uh, is a wonderful story and has overtones which some of us will rec recognize for today. Uh, Saltikev said, no means yes. And she would say, no, 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 yes, yes, yes. And she finally succumbed and uh, after a miscarriage, uh, she subsequently produced a little boy. When that happened, the overjoyed empress rushed into her the birthing room, snatched the imp infant up from the new mother, and carried him off, and thereafter brought him up. For the first eight months of her son Peter's life, uh, Paul's life, excuse me, her husband, husband was Peter, Catherine saw her child briefly three times. During the 18 months,
Catherine lived in Russia as Peter's wife, this lonely young woman began to read. She read many of the great works of the Enlightenment, the French Enlightenment, which spread across Europe. She was particularly attracted to Montesquieu's Spirit of Laws, which analyzed the, analyzed the strengths and weaknesses of despotic rule with its, its thesis that there could be contradictions between a general condemnation of despotism and autocracy and the conduct of a specific despot. Thereafter, for the rest of her life, Catherine attributed, attributed to herself, quote, a Republican soul of the kind advocated by Montesquieu. Once she reached the Russian throne, where the autocrat was by definition a despot, she tried to avoid excesses of personal power and to create a humane government in which efficiency was guided and balanced by intelligence and tolerance. In effect, what Montesquieu had called a benevolent despotism. Later, she declared that uh, Montesquieu's spirit of laws, quote, ought to be the bravery of every monarch with common sense. She also read Voltaire, the venerated patriarch of the Enlightenment. He had concluded that a despotic government might be the best form of government if it were reasonable. Uh, but to be reasonable, he said, the ruler, the despot, must be enlightened, by which he meant uh, have been familiar with and agree with the views of Voltaire. Soon after uh, ascending the throne, Catherine became uh, a correspondent, began a correspondence with Voltaire, which eventually extended to hundreds of fascinating letters back and forth over more than 20 years until he died until she was suddenly catapulted onto the throne when she was 33. Catherine's position maritally and politically was never secure. Her husband Peter's behavior became in increasingly bizarre. He openly announced that on the death of his aunt, Empress Elizabeth, when he became emperor, he would divorce Catherine by sending her to a convent the way Russian uh, emperors Got, or noblemen, for that matter, got rid of their wives. He would reverse all of Russia's European alliance. He admired Germany and Frederick the Great's military achievements. Uh, Frederick the Great was fighting Russia uh, in the Seven Years' War. Peter admired the enemy monarch. Seven Years' War, by the way, we renamed when it slid over into our continent and we called it the French and Indian War. When Elizabeth the Empress died on November 25th, 1761, Catherine's husband became the new emperor, Peter III. It took only six months for him to alienate three of the nation's most powerful institutions, the Orthodox Church, the Russian army, especially the guards regiments, uh, and the nobility. He loudly insulted uh, Catherine, his wife, at a great dinner, which he gave within three months of becoming emperor. To, the dinner was to honor the, the uh, Prussian, not the Russian army, the Prussian army and the Prussian king, Frederick. This was the enemy which the Russians had been fighting for seven years. Thousands had died. They had basically won the war. The Cossacks had ridden, th ridden through Berlin, and suddenly Peter tried to reverse the alliance system and make Russia uh, the ally of, of Prussia. And then he uh, declared a needless war against Denmark. Peter was also, had come from Germany. His mother, the daughter of Peter the Great, had married the Duke of Holstein, and 
uh, Denmark in a previous war had taken some villages on the frontier from Holstein. Uh, Peter was now going to use the Russian army, which he'd belittled, to fight the Danes and take back these villages. The Russian army officers, the soldiers, were not happy. As Catherine wrote uh, later, in the whole empire, he did not have a worse enemy than himself. The church, the Imperial Guards regiments, the citizenry of St. Petersburg had enough, had had enough. Um, a coup d'etat took place. Catherine was proclaimed empress as being the most common uh, com competent of the available um, potential sovereigns. Peter abdicated and was placed by Catherine in detention in a country house. Uh, a week later, he was dead. The leader of the deposed emperor prison guards, uh, Alexei Orlov, the brother, one of the brothers, guards officers all, of her lover then, um, Gr uh, Gregory Orlov, um, wrote to Catherine on a, on a frantic dust and blood-stained note, we ourselves know not what they did, what we did. What they did, what they had done, was to strangle Peter. Uh, they hated him. Uh, he confessed, he begged forgiveness of Catherine. Uh, she said, uh, we will see. She was in a difficult position because these are the people who had supported her, her coup d'etat. She was actually not an instigator of this, uh, but she was undetermined what to do. She understood that they had murdered the deposed emperor. One of the great questions in, uh, in uh, history and biography regarding Catherine was what part she played in the death of the, the, of the emperor. Did she know in advance? Had she ordered this? Did she approve? Russians in general were pleased that Peter was gone, but for the rest of her life, Catherine herself struggled to, to convince European opinion that she was not responsible. It probably would have helped her make this case uh, certainly in Europe, if she had announced, had not announced in, a, in an imperial manifesto, announcing the death of her husband, the former emperor, by saying it was, uh, he died from hemorrhoidal colic. <laughs> Europe naturally was curious about the new emperor, empress. The Earl of Buckinghamshire, the British ambassador, reported to London this, quote, her imperial majesty is neither short nor tall, but she has a majestic air and possesses that happy mixture of dignity and ease, which at once enforces respect and sets men at their ease. She has never been truly beautiful but she has a fine complexion, an animated and intelligent eye, a mouth agreeably turned, and a profusion of glossy chestnut hair. Her neck and hands are remarkably beautiful. Her eyes are the deepest blue. She expresses herself with elegance in French. Reading was her only amusement in the retirement she had to live in during the day, days and years of Empress Elizabeth. The history and interests of the European powers are familiar to her. When she spoke to me of English history, I perceived that what had, what had struck her most was the reign of Queen Elizabeth. The new empress began her work immediately. When she appointed an army general, Vyazmeski, as procurator general of the Senate, uh, 
She explained to him the relationship she expected to have with him personally. She said, you must know with whom you have to deal. You will find that I wish for nothing but the greatest welfare and glory of the fatherland and the happiness of my subjects. I am very fond of the truth, and you may tell me the truth fearlessly and argue with me without any danger, if it leads to good results. You are regarded by all as an honest man. I hope to show you that such people are welcome and do well at my court. And I may add that I require no flattery from you, but only honest and firm behavior. Her reforms and innovations in uh, Russian administration, cultural, social, and uh, other forms of, uh, of uh, the life of a great empire uh, were so numerous, and uh, I can only touch on a few. One is that in 1766, her fourth year on the throne, um, having absorbed Enlightenment political theory, which stressed the power of good laws to change society, she began an attempt to rewrite herself the entire Russian legal code, which was decayed and uh, scattered. Peter the Great would write Ukazi decrees from horseback, and whether they were written down or scribbled uh, and then lost, nobody knew. But Catherine, working two and three hours every morning before she met her current uh, responsibilities and with her ministers, uh, rewrote uh, uh, the legal code in the form of an instruction uh, she planned to implement to create this new legal code. When she had finished the nakaz, the instruction, she summoned a national assembly elected, elected from all the free social classes and ethnic groups of the empire to carry out, uh, actually put in, uh, in legal form and language, a new legal code encompassing a great many things. The equality of citizens consists in the fact that all are subject to the same laws, she wrote. On the issue of crime and punishment, she said, it is better to prevent than to punish crimes. She abolished the use of torture, traditionally, traditionally used in Russia and across Europe, to extract confessions, obtain evidence, obtain uh, names, and determine guilt. She wrote, the accused party on the rack, while in the agonies of torture, is not master enough of himself to be able to, to declare the truth. He will say whatever at that moment he believes will release him from pain. And I have to comment, footnote editorial, that was 250 years ago. A, a few months late, uh, ago, we had six candidates for the American presidency standing on the stage, raising their hands, saying to agree that if elected the presidency, they would reinstitute torture in the form of waterboarding. So we are, have not advanced, some of us, that much. The legislative commission she summoned met for 18 months and broke up because Turkey, the Ottoman Empire, worried about Russian expansionist uh, tendencies toward the Black Sea, which was then a Turkish lake. Uh, Turkey suddenly declared war, and the nobility, which formed a substantial part of the membership of the Legislative Commission, all these men went off to 
take up their roles as army officers. So it's, uh, the commission failed to achieve her goals. No new code of laws was produced. And there was no amelioration of the condition of Russians, Russia's millions of serfs because she could not overcome the opposition of the serf-owning nobility who considered these human beings to be their property. I should explain that in Russia, uh, the nobility, the landowners, uh, considered serfs, uh, the aggregation of serfs and the talents of the serfs in aggregate, uh, represented their wealth not the amount of hectares or acres, not the calculation of the amount of land they owned. So Catherine was proposing to find a way to take away their wealth. Uh, she proposed to do it gradually. She said when land is sold to which the serfs were attached, all the serfs on that land be freed. And she said that will take a hundred years, but we will make a start. Uh, the landowners had some logical objections. They said, okay, if you take away our serfs, our wealth, who and how are we to be compensated? And they also said, if the, most of the serfs in Russia were agricultural laborers, they said, then who is going to sow and reap? And how is Russia going to be fed? And they also made the point, uh, and what about the serfs? They don't own any land. If they uh, can walk away free, what are they going to do? They will starve. None of these questions were addressed uh, because the uh, commission broke up and was never reconvened. But Catherine wrote to Vyazmesky, her procurator general, a grim prediction. She said, a general emancipation from the unbearable and cruel yoke therefore will not ensue. But if we do not agree to a diminution of cruelty and the amelioration of the intolerable position of the peasant serfs, then they themselves will seize it sooner or later. And, and we all know that 100 years later or so, they did. Catherine never met Voltaire. She invited him to come to Russia numerous times, but he always said he was too old and it was too cold. But Denis Denis Diderot, the great French encyclopedist, did come. He wanted to thank her for a gesture she had made early in her reign, which had captivated intellectual Europe. Diderot had spent all of his money publishing the 10 volumes of his work, uh, of his great encyclopedia. Um, and when his beloved daughter came of age to marry, he had no money to provide her with a dowry. So he offered his entire library, the basis of his encyclopedia, for sale. Catherine was told about it by her ambassador in Paris, and she bought it and paid him the double the price he asked. And then she left it in France, in Paris, with Diderot. Uh, appointing her, appointing him her curator, she said, and saying a scholar should not be separated from his work. When Diderot came to Russia, arrived in St. Petersburg, Catherine welcomed him by saying, when, he, when they met, Monsieur Diderot, you see this door by which you have entered this room. That door will be open to you every day between three and five in the afternoon. Diderot came every day and he stayed long past five. Their conversations ranged near and far and Diderot shouted, gesticulated, 
contradicted, contradicted her and called her my, my good lady. He took her hands, shook her arm, tapped her legs to make his points. Catherine wrote to a European friend, I emerged from my interviews with him with my thighs bruised. I have been obliged to put a table between us <laughs> to protect myself and my limbs. Once Diderot realized he'd gone too far in a debate, argument, and apologized for his, he said, great impertinence, she replied, nonsense. How, could there, how can there be impertinence between equals? Catherine's private life was never private. She had 12 lovers during her life. The official term for most of them when she became empress was favorites, all of whom were given titles and positions at court. There are She's been criticized, of course, for this, but there are explanations, I think, for her behaviors, which her detractors in her day, mostly foreign, painted as licentiousness. Um, if you consider, however, sleeping in the same bed from age 16 to 25 with a sexually disinterested young man who denied her not only physical intimacy, but so also any warmth, companionship, and mutual understanding, you may uh, see the forces working within her. And even today, this subject would not be acceptable to most of us, uh, men and, and women alike, I believe. Um, and she came, Catherine came of age in the Russian court in, during the time of the sensualist uh, Empress Elizabeth, who had many more lovers than Catherine and who had been the one to force Catherine to produce a baby with somebody, almost anybody would do. When she became empress uh, and a widow, she no, long, lo, lo, no longer needed to hide anything. As the years passed, she became caught up in a search for the fountain of youth. She attempted to preserve her own youth by identifying with the affection and, and ha having the affection simulated, if necessary, of six or seven younger men. The most important man in Catherine's life was Gregory Potemkin. He was a large, powerful uh, man from the lesser nobility, a cavalry officer in the guards, brilliant, inventive, brave, and witty. Potemkin had a remarkable ability as a mimic. Um, he was, br Catherine had a, n a number of 20, 25 particular friends, and there being uh, no movies, no television, they gathered together three or four times a week after the day was done, and would play charades, car they play card games, drink and talk. And uh, one of the uh, army officers uh, thought that Potemkin, who was 10 years younger than Catherine, would be uh, an amusing distraction for Catherine with his ability to mimic. So they brought him, she agreed to, that he be invited to one of these evenings. And she came up to him and said, Colonel Potemkin, I understand you have a remarkable ability to mimic. Would you demonstrate it? And uh, she was uh, short, he was tall. He smiled at her, looked down at her and smiled and said uh, something in Catherine's voice with her accent, using her body language, uh, perfectly mimicking the empress. The people in the room thought, whatever we expected, God knows what's gonna to happen to this poor man. 
what happened was that Catherine looked at him, began to smile, and then burst into delighted laughter. They didn't become lovers for another 10 years. By then, Potemkin was a celebrated cavalry officer in the wars against Turkey. Um, but uh, when, they, when their affair began, he was 35, she was 45. Um, and their love affair was passionate. Potemkin uh, was uh, very, not egotistical, but confident of his own uh, powers, his status, who he was. He wasn't going to give any ground to anybody. And that's partly why Catherine loved him. But he, like some men, even today I'm told, was extremely jealous. He couldn't bear the idea that Catherine had known sexually men before him. And he would rage and rant, slam doors, storm out of rooms, that doesn't happen today, I'm sure. <laughs> uh, and uh, she wrote a number of letters, sensible letters, loving letters, trying to calm him down. Here are two of them. She wrote, if fate had given, him, had given me in my youth a husband whom I could have loved, I would have remained true to him forever. The trouble is that my heart is loath to be without love for a single day. If you want to keep me forever, then show me as much friendship as love, and more than anything else, always tell me the truth. Later, in another letter, she added, you must be certain by now that I love you. I want you to love me. I want to appear desirable to you. I know how bad it is to love so extraordinarily. It is an illness I recognize. I am ill, only I don't send for the chemist or write long letters. But now I have just written you a long letter. I shall paraphrase this page for you in three words and cross out all the rest. I love you. Together, Catherine and Gregory Potemkin ruled Russia for 17 years until he died. He was her confidant, her iblis administrator, her conqueror, and viceroy in the south. He began to build all the great cities of southern Russia, Sebastopol, uh, uh, Odessa, etc., etc. And he also Potemkin became possibly, probably, possibly, no one knows, her secret morganatic husband. The way biographers deal with this is, is there is a story that. So you don't position yourself right behind the assertion. You say that other people have believed this. It's a cop out. <laughs> Even after Potemkin left her bed and both had other lovers, he remained the most powerful man in the empire and her closest friend. Potemkin loved music and took his own symphony. He was very wealthy, thanks to Catherine. He took his own symphony orchestra with him on military campaigns. Even Eisenhower didn't, didn't do that. <laughs> and one was with him on his last campaign against the Turks in 1791. The Russian ambassador in Vienna, hoping to please the great man, uh, suggested that he send what he described as one of the best pianists and finest composers in Germany to work for Potemkin. Potemkin, Potemkin agreed. The offer was made. The pianist composer accepted. But both Potemkin 
and Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart died before the journey could take place. There were many personalities inside this woman who happened to be an empress. She re revealed the empress side of her when near the end of her reign, she was asked, asked how she exercised the quote, unlimited power with which she ruled her empire and the blind obedience uh, with which her orders were obeyed. This is a quote from somebody talking to her grandson, the Tsar Alexander I. And Catherine smiled and answered, it's not as easy as you think. In the first place, my orders would not be carried out unless they were the kind of orders which could be carried out. You know with what prudence and circumspection I act in the promulgation of my laws. I examine the circumstances. I take advice. I consult the enlightened part of my people. And so in this way, I find out what sort of effect my laws will have. And when I am already convinced of good approval, then I issue my orders and have the pleasure of observing what you call blind obedience. That is the foundation of unlimited power. But believe me, they will not obey blindly when orders are not adapted to the opinion of the people. And on the other side, she revealed the woman she was when growing old, she wrote to her, her close friend, the philosopher Friedrich Grimm, who lived in Paris. She wrote, the day before yesterday, on February 9th, it was 50 years since I arrived with my mother in Moscow. I doubt if there are 10 people living today in St. Petersburg who remember. There is still Betskoy, blind, decrepit, gaga, asking young people whether they remember Peter the Great. There is Nerishkin, who denies the past but because he does not want to reveal that he is so old. There is one of my old maids, whom I still keep, although she forgets everything. These are all the proofs of old age, and I am one of them. But in spite of this, I am as, as eager as a, ch a five-year-old child to play blind man's bluff, and the young people, including my grandchildren, say that their games are never so merry as when I play with them. And I still love to laugh. During her lifetime, different observers each found a different woman. In her youth, her friends saw her indomitable spirit cool courage, and driving ambition. On the throne, foreign ambassadors saw a brilliant, complex politician and diplomat. The men of the Enlightenment saw a philosopher queen, apparently willing to transform their abstractions into reality, or at least to try. The Russian people saw a monarch who asked for laws based on tolerance and natural justice, who established schools for doctors, uh, training academies for young women, created libraries, and the world's greatest art collection. She, Catherine the Great, the Empress of Russia, was the first person in Russia to be inoculated against smallpox. It was being done in Britain, uh, and she brought uh, it was spreading among enlightened people all over the world. Uh, Thomas Jefferson was inoculated early. Catherine brought a doctor from the University of Edinburgh uh, to Russia and instructed him to inoculate her. She was begged, appealed to, begged by many Russians not to risk uh, what they thought was uh, a very risky uh, uh, procedure. She did it anyway. She made the donor, a young boy, a count. Uh, and then 
the second person she had, af the, the person after her, the second person in Russia, she had inoculated was her son, Paul, the heir to the throne. Um, who, who else was she? Uh, historians have uh, studied a woman with a sophisticated ability to read and write intellectual documents, an understanding of foreign affairs, a deep curiosity and interest in the cultural and the intellectual life of her century, and a remarkable ability to command and overall her own people. She was truly a majestic figure in the age of monarchy. In Russian history, she and Peter the Great tower in ability and achievement over the other 14 czars and empresses uh, of the 300-year Romanov dynasty. She came to the throne uh, 37 years after Peter's death, but she was the true inheritor of his greatness and the second architect of the new Russia. Her hand was gentler than his, confident of herself and unshakable in her purposes. She always, always overcame any desire for personal revenge. She instilled in her ministers, generals, and favorites not so much a fear of her displeasure as a zeal to win her favor. Beyond raising herself to the imperial throne and ruling Russia for 34 years, the greatest testimony to her character, personality, and political genius was the popular image she left behind. She identified herself so completely with Russia and the nation's interests that few Russians, when she died, bothered to remember that she was really only a little German girl who came to them when she was 14 across the snow. Thank you. Thank you. I'll, I'll tell you two things I didn't know when I wrote the book, which have happened since. Um, uh, and then I'll be happy to try and answer your questions. Uh, in New York, I met the uh, German Consul General. I was invited by him for, to a celebration of the 300th anniversary of the birth of Frederick the Great, who was a great man, uh, one of the greatest uh, generals in European history, also a composer of considerable talent. He, he played the flute himself, uh, a big WQXR, the music station, the public radio music station in New York, uh, played some of Frederick's, over several days, Frederick's flute sonatas, and they were good. Uh, anyway, this man came up to me and said, uh, Mr. Massey, uh, uh, thank you for writing this book and telling people that Catherine the Great was really German. My, uh, my, uh, one of my previous uh, assignments, I think he'd been an ambassador to Ireland. It's interesting, the, the, the New York City Council Generalship should appear a higher rung ambassadorship to Ireland. But anyway, he said, I was chief of protocol for our chancellor, uh, Angela Merkel. And uh, Angela Merkel is now, I think, uh, I don't know whether any, anybody would disagree, the most powerful political woman in the world. Uh, she has struggled to maintain the euro, uh, et cetera, et cetera, you, you know all this. But you didn't know, and you don't know, and I didn't know that he said, she keeps a framed photograph of a large portrait of Catherine the Great 
on her desk every day. So here were two little German girls. Merkel was born in East Germany, hated communism, uh, began to participate in the, the politics of the unified Germany, and there she is. Really, uh, uh, who can say that there's another woman who is or has been as powerful in our age as Angela Merkel? The second is that uh, uh, I have thought when I was writing the books uh, about getting the words down on the page which would portray her. Two of the books have already become films uh, with which I was uh, pleased and displeased, mostly by, by the uh, Hollywood effort to sensationalize uh, events and personalities. There's going to be a film of Catherine the Great. Uh, I have, uh, I had not thought of that. I thought it was uh, impossible to make because she lived, every part of her life was fascinating and, and contributed to her great success. Uh, so it was sold to uh, a movie company and a network, ABC, and they've spent months trying to decide whether to make it a, uh, a movie theater movie, two hours or so, how can you cram this life into that, or to make it a, a mini-series. And uh, finally, ABC has decided to stretch it out and make a mini-series. The producer's a wonderful woman, uh, not young, which I'm pleased by. I don't want some 25-year-old trying to sensationalize Catherine. You understand my take on her. Uh, and the screenwriter is also not young. He's a kid compared to me, but he's 68. <laughs> and he's a great director, a great screenwriter, and a great actor. So I'm in good hands. Now, uh, as I discussed with Terry and uh, Terry Hughes and a couple of other talented, beautiful young women at lunch yesterday, we were casting. And who knows, I have a couple of ideas, but I don't get a vote. The writer of the book never does. Anyway, I didn't know this until a couple of weeks ago, and I thought you'd be interested. It's time for me to cross my fingers. I care a great deal about how my books appear. I th guess every writer does. But since these are historically important figures, I want them to be portrayed uh, accurately, which means, as Voltaire would say, that they agree with me. <laughs> Do you have any questions? In back. How did you dare to enter Satan's cave and uh, so come Could you out? start over? How did you dare to enter Satan's ca uh, day, uh, cave? Uh, the evil empire and managed to come out. Uh, did you limp or got your hip crushed? You're talking about me. Okay. Uh, I first went in 1967 when I was writing Nicholas and Alexandra. I wrote Nicholas and Alexandra because my first child, our first child, a son, was born with hemophilia. Uh, and I was uh, interested in how Nicholas II, the last star, and his wife dealt with hemophilia at the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, when uh, we got some money, because writers are not rich, we're not all John Grisham or, or, or uh, whoever, but uh, we went to Paris, where I could go to Russia more easily. It's like going to New York to Chicago. Uh, I had uh, 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 that was I, I guess that was when I was uh, had published Nicholas Alexander. That's how we got the money. 
we went to Paris. I was writing Peter the Great, and uh, I was going to Russia a lot. And the Russians, the Soviets, had reacted to Peter the, uh, to Nicholas uh, with, the, I guess, the kindest word would be distaste. Massey apparently is a CIA hack who has written a propaganda, uh, propagandistic book about the last, uh, uh, last of the emperors and so forth. Uh, if I'm a CIA hack, I haven't been paid yet. Uh, but um, the uh, attitude towards me, I was allowed in, but there was no material available, so I was restricted. The archives were closed. Nicholas was not so much uh, an enemy of the people anymore, but an unperson. But there was no material, so I went around and looked at buildings and verified that the sky was blue and the grass was green and so forth. Uh, but the KGB was dealing with the fact that American tourists uh, had read the book, and some of them were bringing the book with them and leaving them the, with their in-tourist guides. And it went into Sami's Dot, which is uh, people typing the book and handing it around amongst them, themselves, St. Petersburg and Moscow particularly. Um, so they decided they had to deal with it. And they had, had a conference of university professors and various authorities uh, overseen by various KGB goons, you know, like this. Uh, they, the the uh, verdict was uh, Massey has some things accurate. The, uh, the last star was a weak man. Uh, but uh, basically, the, uh, the verdict was that I was not being politically provocative. Uh, I don't think they ever retracted the CIA version, but uh, that I was a bad historian who had left out uh, the signif significant role in the coming of the revolution of Lenin, about him, about whom, uh, I guess only Jesus has more biograph biographical type material written about him. Anyway, um, in Russia. Uh, anyway, uh, I was taken off the verboten list and uh, I responded by saying, wherever, whenever I was asked about this, I don't understand. Uh, Marx and Engels said, and the Soviet, uh, the Bolsheviks uh, adapted, adopted this uh, business of uh, the inevitability of the coming of communism. Uh, capitalism will inevitably lead to its own decline. It will destroy itself by greed and so forth and so on. Uh, and there's no role. This is going to happen. Individuals play no role. Wait a, minute, wait a minute, somebody in the KGB had just said, Massey ignores the role of Lenin. But the dogma was individuals play no part. I pointed that out. Uh, it was never uh, resolved. <laughs> Either Lenin landed, which was, he did very much. People, people make history. They make it in the context of their environment and the economic and all other cultural and uh, and uh, uh, economic and all the other uh, influences on their their lives. But they make make they make history, I believe. Anyway, thereafter, people could take it in. Uh, I was never strip searched the way my wife was, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So I could travel, and Peter the Great was a hero, uh, and Catherine was still a, a little German girl uh, who had become. The Soviets didn't want a German girl, because of what they'd suffered in the Great War, the Second World War, to become 
the absolute heroine which Russians of her day uh, thought she was. That's a long-winded answer, but uh, best I can do. Anybody else? Yeah. Potemkin villages, fact or fiction? Fiction. Uh, Potemkin did build uh, the uh, urban structure, the economic health, I mean, planting certain grains, orchards, uh, um, maybe you could, I can find a copy of my book for you. Okay, well, so you just want everybody to know. It was all what we would politely call BS. Uh, Catherine took along all of the ambassadors, foreign ambassadors in St. Petersburg, except the Saxon, the ambassador of Saxony, who had already proved a pain. She left him behind, and he generated this. She took uh, along not only all the ambassadors, but she invited uh, Joseph II, the Emperor of Austria, uh, on another Enlightenment-influenced monarch, and he said, uh, I wouldn't have believed it, believed what I saw, unless I had seen it with my own, own eyes. Uh, of course, as I say in the book, they did paint the villages and scrape, the, scrape them clean, and so uh, as the boat procession of boats went down the Dnieper, but uh, it wasn't all cardboard. Uh, and that's one of the uh, cliche, uh, the phrase is stuck in, in the vocabulary as fake. And people use it all the time. You, you encountered, it's another Potemkin village. Well, that, that slanders Potemkin, Catherine, and Russia. One more. Let's do one, one more. One more. One last question. The game okay. begins in a half an hour, uh, right? Oh, well. Well, let's have a round of applause for our author.